Hello. This is democratizing multiplayer game development. Um, it's sort of a specialization of the Unity vision, which, as you know, is generally speaking, democratizing game development. Um, the networking team and I at Unity have a particular passion and love for multiplayer games and technology, and so this is our uh, this is our specialization of that vision. Uh, our internal project name is UNET, which is uh, Unity Networking, and uh, this is the new Unity multiplayer technology. So I'd like to start by talking a little bit about the Unity Networking team, just so you have uh, some idea of who are these people that are, that are making this stuff for you. Um, this is a group of uh, veteran MMO developers, and um, We've got many, many years of experience making MMO games and technology. Uh, and so we, we have this passion for democratizing uh, multiplayer game development, and that's why we all came to Unity, so we could do this great thing for you. Uh, and to us, this democratization means making the, the tools and technology for uh, multiplayer game development available to everyone. Everyone should be able to make multiplayer games. Everyone should be able to make an MMO if they have a vision and a passion to do so. Uh, so I only said tools and technology. I also meant to say uh, infrastructure. So this is, uh, these are things that I'll talk more about uh, in this presentation. Uh, to talk a little bit about my, uh, my team members, um, I wanted to just touch on some of the games that they've worked on to give you a sense of the kind of scale of stuff that we've done in the past. So there's uh, Alexi, who's, uh, who shipped Need for Speed World Online uh, and Project Copernicus. Well, didn't ship, but you guys probably are familiar with it. Um, there's Alex, who's, uh, who has shipped Dungeons & Dragons Online, Lord of the Rings Online, Infinite Crisis. Jeremy, uh, Marvel Heroes Online, most recently, and uh, DDO, Lotro, Infinite Crisis. We have uh, Larus, who's worked on Fusion Fall, and our, the Unity... Uh, legacy networking system, and Sean has worked on World of Warcraft and Diablo 3 Ultima Online. And then there's me, your presenter. <laughs> so I've worked on uh, Ultima Online, Dungeons and Dragons, Lord of the Rings, Infinite Crisis. Um, I'm the uh, director of development in Copenhagen and the lead for this networking team. A uh, little bit of info about this picture. Um, twice a year, all of engineering gathers in Copenhagen to, to focus on exploring new technologies and to try to innovate and bring cool new things for all of you. And uh, at the end of that week, we, we have a party and we celebrate our accomplishments. And uh, this is the sort of thing that happens at that party. So how will Unity democratize multiplayer game development? Uh, like I said, our vision is to enable all game developers to be able to build multiplayer games, any type of game, any number of players. So everything from uh, like perhaps a turn-based card game to some fast action first-person shooter, uh, from just head-to-head -head gameplay to massively multiplayer. So what we do is we start with a solid new multiplayer foundation and uh, today's talk is uh, primarily about this. And after I've gone through our vision, I'll give you an overview of this, and then we'll drill into detail. So, the, so then the rest of the plan is, uh, after we've, we've built this multiplayer foundation and put it out into your hands, uh, we want to check back with you, and we want to get your feedback. Uh, and I should note that uh, I was actually out here last year speaking to a number of teams in Korea, um, I have a huge respect for the work that you developers have done and some of the MMOs that you've created. They're truly great and have truly changed the genre. And I really wanted to get some feedback from you. And uh, I did, and I took that back, and we've incorporated a lot of this into what we've done for you. Uh, so then, yeah, we'll continue to get your feedback, and we'll continue to refine this technology. And, uh, yeah, finally, we build the rest of our vision from that foundation, incorporating your feedback. So what do I mean by the multiplayer foundation? 
It is easy to use professional networking technology tools and infrastructure for making your game multiplayer. And uh, as if you were at the keynote this morning, uh, David mentioned, uh, mentioned these points. Uh, we, we have a high performance transport layer, which is moving packets at uh, ridiculous speeds. Uh, there's a low level API, which is uh, like a socket like interface to this high performance transport layer. So if you're if you're a very skilled networking engineer, you probably want or would like to use this interface. Uh, we, of course, have the high-level API, which is establishing a simple and secure uh, client-server networking model. And uh, if you're not a networking engineer, but you just want to make multiplayer games, this is for you. Uh, we created some infrastructure to help with the associated problems with multiplayer, so getting players to find each other. We have the matchmaker, which provides basic functionality for creating rooms and helping players find other players. And then the relay server is solving connectivity problems between players trying to play together behind firewalls. Uh, so our roadmap looks like this. Uh, the way we develop technology in Unity is we, we like to do things in phases. So we'll create a, a phase one, and then we'll put it out to you, and then we, then we solicit your, your needs and your feedback of this, and then we feed that back into our existing plans for phase two and phase three. And in this way, there's a, there's a constant feedback loop and iteration on the technologies. And so we do the same thing with, with uh, networking here. So with phase one, we have the multiplayer foundation. Uh, this is not in 5.0, but uh, will be released in the 5.x cycle. And we want to extend from this foundation, and we want to start doing things like server authoritative gameplay. Um, this is being researched and developed right now, so there's no, there's no release date for it. But uh, this, this, is, uh, this is being worked on right now. And then phase three, of course, uh, I think will be defined largely by your feedback. So this, this uh, relationship that we have where we, you know, we, we listen to you and we create technology and then we, we listen to you again um, is really important to us. So, yes, we'll be back and we, we will be looking for, for more interaction. So with the, with the vision sort of out of the way, uh, I wanted to just give you a, a bit of an overview of the Multiplayer Foundation um, before we dive right into the, the details. So why, why did we create this? Uh, like I say, you know, I, I've t spoken with a number of developers, um, and you know, it became apparent that we had some inherent limitations with our legacy system. Uh, it was built with more normal, client-hosted, small multiplayer games in mind, and was not really designed to scale to MMO levels of concurrency, uh, nor support dedicated authoritative servers. Uh, we built it high level first and focused on making it easy to multiplayer enable games, uh, but it was not designed for exposing low level access to uh, network internals. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of frustration from networking engineers where they, <clears throat> they felt they could not have uh, the, the, the amount of control over performance that they wanted. The legacy system was built on top of a, a pretty good third party library. But, of course, that library is not under our control. And uh, the performance and quality level improvements we wanted to make would just be better and faster from uh, starting from scratch. So the design plan is basically uh, solve the hardest problems to address all game developers' needs. So as you know, fast action games uh, have some of the uh, hardest performance problems to solve in networking. Um, you know, I think it's usually true that fast action games need to use UDP. The reason, of course, being that uh, TCP will not give you the most recent packets if there was a drop packet preceding it. And uh, in fast action, we cannot wait for our packets. And so MMO games contain some of the hardest networking concurrency problems to solve. Um, so, as you may know, event-driven I.O., such as I.O. completion ports, KQ and ePoll, uh, are really the optimal way to handle massive I.O. operations. Uh, asynchronous notifications from the OS are always going to be more efficient than uh, uh, solutions such as Select. 
So therefore, the plan, a UDP-based solution with event-driven I.O., with both a high- and low-level script API, uh, making all online games possible. So the high-performance transport layer, as I mentioned, is, is an optimized UDP-based protocol. The, the design is uh, multi-channel based to avoid head-of-line blocking issues. There is support for a variety of quality of service settings per channel. Uh, you can even get reliable UDP and even something much like TCP based on these configurations if you so choose. Uh, there are highly customized network parameters such as timeouts, flow control, and packet size. There's a flexible network topology that supports, of course, peer-to-peer -peer or client-server architectures. And we have the uTransport class for low-level API access. And I'll be showing you uh, some code using the uTransport class in a little bit. So the high-level API um, has support for the server and the client in the same process for so-called client-hosted games. There's a general-purpose serializer. Can, of course, send and receive network messages. The high-level API has an inherent uh, client-server model like, built into it. And as such, networked commands from clients go to servers. And remote procedure calls go from servers to clients. Uh, and networked events will go from servers to clients. But we don't allow clients to talk directly to clients with the high-level API uh, in order to ensure a simpler model and uh, to add a little bit of security. Of course, if you did want to go client to client, you can use the low-level API. And, uh, and we, of course, have the uServer and uClient classes for managing collect connections and uh, other operations in the high-level API. So integration within the engine and the editor. Uh, we have configurable automatic synchronization of object transforms. Um, there is automatic synchronization of script variables. We have support for placing networked objects in Unity scenes. And these things are, um, are accomplished through our new unit view component for networked objects and our new uh, unit behavior class for network scripts. And I will show you an example of this uh, in a live demo where I uh, will be turning a, a very simple uh, single-player game into a very simple multiplayer game. And then there's our infrastructure. So the infrastructure is, of course, uh, our matchmaking service where you can create and advertise matches, list and join available matches, and we have the UMatch class for access to these matchmaking capabilities. We have a relay server, which is allowing gameplay over the internet with no dedicated server, and will route messages for participants of matches. And this is all hosted by Unity. And uh, of course, we've taken care of the process dynamically scaling up and down based on demand. So with the overview out of the way, uh, I would like to now go into a little bit of detail. Uh, so starting with the high-level API, uh, the object lifecycle management looks like this. We have uh, objects which are spawned on the server are going to be automatically created on clients, meaning there's no extra code that you have to write. Uh, similarly, objects destroyed on the server are automatically destroyed on the clients. Uh, clients joining a game in progress are sent all existing objects with latest current state via what we call sync vars, which are synchronized variables, and transforms. And uh, of course, this is also just done for you. There's no extra code. And then there's, uh, of course, no management of buffered RPC calls like in the old system. So I mentioned earlier that we have this inherent client-server model built into the high-level API. So every game must have a server that hosts the game. 
each participant in a multiplayer game can be a client, a dedicated server, or one combination of both. And the combination role is the common case of a multiplayer game with no dedicated server. Uh, so the player that creates the game becomes the server for that game, and then they have basically a local client instead of a remote client. And this local client uses the same Unity scenes and objects as the server and will communicate using message queues instead of the network. We also have this concept of the ready state. And, and I should explain the, 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 the problem we're trying to solve first. So a lot of times when a client connects to a server, um, before they can actually um, defend themselves, they may find themselves in a bit of a vulnerable state. And you'll see you know, these so-called uh, these spawn kills, which is not a lot of fun. So what we've done is sort of put that into a two-step thing. So a client that connects is not initially in the ready state and doesn't receive uh, object state updates or object spawn messages. So this allows the client time to do um, any initialization or loading or whatever your game requires without being interrupted by the server or other players. And then, once a client is ready, they can safely enter the game or the match just by calling uClient.ready. And the server will handle that event and uh, acknowledge that the player is in the game with uh, a call to use server, player is ready in the handler. So this diagram attempts to show the previous two concepts. So we have the client-server model. And here we have a client, first he'll connect to a server, but he's not yet receiving um, these updates. When the client, but he has received the uh, connect message from the server, and when he's uh, prepared to go, he will call ready. The server then responds with uh, something like an object spawn back to the client. So now there's an instance of a player, this player, on the server, and the server says, yeah, it's okay to create an instance of yourself locally, and then he does. And then throughout gameplay, the, ser the client will send commands to the server, and the server will result with uh, you know, either state updates to all clients or client RPC calls to uh, one or more specific clients. Objects that are created on the server are then spawned on the clients with these object spawn messages. Similarly, object destroy messages clean those up. And then the client simply disconnects and uh, their session is over. So sync vars in the high-level API are, are shorthand for synchronized variables. Uh, these are declared in script on UNet behaviors. They are auto-updated on clients when they are changed on the server. So there is no code that you have to write for this. And they do have an optimized code generation serialization functions. And uh, I'll explain this uh, optimized code generation in a, in a few slides. So here, this uh, code sample shows that we've got a couple variables that we've marked with sync var, so health, for example. Ah. And uh, this function is, of course, running on the server. And just by some logic, they decide to decrement health. Then on the client, that variable is automatically updated, and it just works. So commands. These are declared in script on unit behaviors with this command attribute. Command arguments are automatically serialized for you. Uh, there is an optimized co-generated calling path for each command. And it is secure, as commands can only be invoked on the client's player object on the server. So in this code sample, we have used the command attribute for this method, cmd thrust. 
And here in updates, we've tagged it as client callback to, so you know that this is running on the client. Uh, client decides that he needs to call CMD thrust, and then this is invoked on the server. And uh, this, this sample sort of implies that we've hooked things up with our unit view component such that uh, certain physics have just been automatically uh, synchronized for you. So when these things change on the server, they will change on the client. And that's all you have to do. So client RPCs, uh, similarly declared in script on unit behaviors with the client RPC attribute. Uh, these arguments are also automatically serialized. And it, it, there is also an optimized code-generated calling path for each RPC call. Uh, it is invoked on the object on each client when called from the server. So this code sample is sort of the analog to what we saw with commands in that we have this method, this function, tagged as client RPC. And this update function is running on the server. So the server simply decides to call this RPC with this value. And now all the clients get that as a result. And that just works. And then there's sync events. Uh, also declared in script on unit behaviors with our sync event attributes. And these are like RPC calls, but the events can propagate to other scripts on client. Uh, this can be used to build modular and extensible network systems. So as I was saying in some of the previous slides, we have some optimized code generation happening. So uh, I would like to talk a little bit about what that detail means. So this is a post-process that's adding code. But it never changes APIs, never breaks user code. This works with .NET IL, so it supports all languages. And users can inspect script DLLs with ILSpy to see this generated code. There is no reflection in generated code. And this is, of course, to maximize runtime performance. And this often implements virtual functions from unit behavior. So here's an example of code generation for sync vars. Uh, the code on the left shows a number of variables that we've tagged with sync vars. But uh, specifically, if we look at health, then on the right, this would be the generated code. And right around here, you can see that we have automatic serialization of health, but only if it's been changed. So this is a nice optimization that just happens for you automatically. And we do not uh, unnecessarily use bandwidth. We're only sending these, uh, the bits that need to be sent. So that's nice for performance. That's nice for bandwidth. Uh, and code generation for commands. So this was the CMD thrust uh, example that we had before. So a user defines this. And a function called call CMD thrust is generated with a matching signature. And I'll show you that on the next page. Calls to CMD thrust in user code are then replaced with calls to call CMD thrust. So this is call CMD thrust. Uh, and as you can see, it's, it sends the CMD message to the server. There's no reflection. It has a matching signature. There are, of course, auto serialization of arguments, as you can see down here. And then invoke CMD thrust will be called on the server. So this is the, in the server side. So this is invoked on the server when the generated function is called on the client. The target function is invoked directly, so there's no reflection. And there is, of course, auto deserialization of arguments. And then this is what the generated code would look like. And then we have the UNET view component. So in the editor, 
This is what our inspector looks like for our UNED view. And I'll actually show you this in the editor in a moment. So it controls an object's network identity and how its state is synchronized between participants in the network. And through this inspector, the user can control the, the physics transforms, like I was mentioning before, uh, control how uh, those in movement are synchronized, how often updates are sent by a send rate, um, and it also shows some useful information about the object's network state. So now I'd like to show you a live demo using the high-level API to easily, quickly add or make your single-player game multiplayer. Um, specifically, this is showing how fast you can just get player objects moving across server and clients. So, what I have here is a little mock-up of an old arcade game called Joust. Um, it's really very basic, and I've got a little um, buzzard ostrich thing here. So, as a single-player game, I would just drag my guy onto the scene. And if I play it, now you have to forgive the foot sliding, but you can see he's just simply walking around doing his thing. Uh, the only thing on this is a, is a script for player input, and it's basically just getting keyboard input and then calling translate. Right, but we want to make it multiplayer. So let's get rid of him. And I will create an empty game object that I'll call the network manager. And I will put a simple script on that called, well, let me show you the script first. So this is kind of boilerplate code, and we've included it in the Unity manual for UNET. And all I've done for this demo to kind of show how easy it can go is I've literally copied and pasted the sample code from the Unity manual into this little script. Uh, basically, there's an update function, and depending on uh, some keyboard input, we'll set up a server, or we'll set up a client, or if I want to do client hosted, I'll do both. So let's look at the setup server. This is very basic. So we get, us, we get an instance of our server. We listen on a specific port, and then we register a handler for the, the ready message from the client. So the ready message from the client comes in, and the server will instantiate a player prefab. He'll then just set an arbitrary position and inform the player that they are, in fact, ready and that they should instantiate their local version of the player free prefab as well. So before we look at the client, let's go back to this. So here you see we just have a simple variable for IP, for port, and player prefab. So let's take this guy. For the player prefab, right now we only have this player input script. We also need to add our unit view component. And here, I'll set the server transform to 2D, since this is a very simple thing. Um, I won't bother with this right now. I'll set the send rate to something like 20. And then we'll leave it at that. So then going back to our network manager, the client simply creates a new version of the client, connects to the IP import that we specified, registers a connect handler so that when they try to connect to a server, they can hear the response from the server. And then, of course, they register the player free prefab that will be created when the server tells them, yes, the player is indeed ready. So this is that handler for connect. This is where you might uh, handle any kind of initialization or other setup you want to do before you get into a match. But this is just a simple demo, so we're just going to call ready right away. And then, of course, back up here, 
The server gets the ready message, instantiates the prefab, and off we go. So now we want to look at this player input script. So as we mentioned, we have to send commands from the client to the server. We can't just do this on the client anymore. So we need to do a couple of things, but it's really basic. First, we make it a unit view behavior class. And then, as I mentioned, we needed to make a command. So we'll do that. Public void translate float y. And I'll take this, put it there. And of course, we call it here. Right. And then one last thing. We don't want update to be run, or we don't, rather, we don't want this logic to be run if we're not the local player. So we'll simply add a test. Return. Yeah, OK. And that's it. So to summarize, we added, we changed the player input class to be a unit behavior. We checked if we are local player, and we bail out if not. And then we created a command to send to the server. So going back to our project, I'm actually going to uh, just build this. Or actually, let me show you the player prefab again. So now, after we've added that command, you can see this uh, inspector for the player input script now shows you that we've added a command. So that's kind of nice to see in the editor your list of uh, commands and, and sync fars and things like that. So uh, I just want to do a quick build to show you that, yes, this is, in fact, uh, what I said it was. And it should just take a minute. Let's call it Joust. Of course, this being a live demo, you never know what can go wrong. So I have a backup if that is the case. But it's a short, small project, so it should really just be a minute. And it is. OK. So uh, let's the first one be both. So a uh, server with a local client. And I just have to minimize that. And create a client. And just like that, I've got uh, player movement in a multiplayer setup. One more. Now we've got three, three jousters. Yes. And that's all it takes to make my little single player game a multiplayer game. Of course, obviously multiplayer games are a little bit more involved and you have more variables to sync up. Um, but using the rest of the high level API is just that easy. Um, and this is not really just a, a contrived example. So there's a game team in New York called Darkwind that we've been working with. And they're making a game called Wolverblade for the Xbox One. This is a, a, like a 2D side-scrolling fighter, very similar to Golden Axe. And their game was single player, and they wanted to make it multiplayer using Unet. So uh, we got a hold of their, their game, and we started working with them. And in half a day, we had their game uh, support multiplayer over the network. Now, we're doing some more interesting things with them, but that's, that's a very real uh, use case. So 
Uh, we'll worry about that later. So back to the presentation. So the low-level API. So we just finished talking about the high-level API. Um, so this is now a bit more detail about the low-level API. As I've mentioned before, this is uh, UDP-based to avoid dropped and out-of-order packet problems inherent with TCP. We have many quality of service options uh, per channel, and I'll have some details for that on the next slide for you. There's, of course, uh, flow control and send rate limiting, meaning that uh, you know, we'll just increase the send rate until we start to detect drop packets, then we'll reduce the send rate until optimal. And this is, of course, configurable if you'd rather just uh, set that yourself. There's a separate keep alive stream to support reliable and flow control. We have different reactor models for sending and receiving packets. Um, and there's host migration, which is uh, an optional ability to enable migration for client hosts that drop out. Um, I, I know that host migration can be very uh, game specific, so this would be something you could choose if it made sense for your game. So these are some of those quality of service options that I was mentioning. Um, unreliable, of course, means it uh, could be delivered out of order or not at all. And you might use that for something like chat messages. So then uh, fragmented it basically means a packet that's larger than the maximum transmission unit, and so it becomes multi-part. Uh, sequenced means, of course, it will be delivered in sequence or not at all. Uh, you might use that for streaming media. We have, of course, reliable, which means it will be delivered, but maybe not in order. So you might use that for sending damage. Um, of course, fragmented is, again, a multi-part packet. And reliable sequenced, it will be delivered end in sequence. So, of course, this is uh, very much like TCP then. There's state update, so the most recent message will be delivered, and you use that for sending things like position. And we have all-cost delivery, where we send with no wait timer for retransmit. It's just, it's just drilling that out into the network. Um, you use that for things like maybe firing a bullet. So here I have a slide with some example code but I actually would rather just go back to Visual Studio. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we wrote just like a simple echo server using our low-level API, uh, like specifically uh, receive data, and then we send that data right back out. But this shows uh, a lot of the options available in the low-level API. So yeah, here we've set the reactor model to be select-based. And then we add a tuner that has, in this case, default values for some of the, the channels and the network settings. Now we'll have, uh, we'll have tuners for things like, well, let's call them uh, typical game types. So we'll have a tuner for uh, shooters, we'll have a tuner for uh, turn-based, and so on. And even if you pick a tuner, you can still go in and change specific values to suit your needs. So, you know, you can send, you can set the min update timeout to uh, here's 10, 10 milliseconds, um, and so on. So then we set, so then uh, the low level API is, of course, channel based. And here we've, uh, we've defined two channels for this example. Channel zero, we've set to the quality of service unreliable sequenced. And in channel one, we're using reliable fragmented. And then, of course, we have a number of other like network configuration options we can change. So uh, network drop threshold, 5%. Um, packet size, 1,100 bytes. Ping timeout milliseconds, and so on. Yeah, and then it's very, very similar to we just do a connect. And as I said, you know, we have uh, receive. And the event type is data event, and we receive data, and we send it back out. 
And so that's, that's a code sample for the low-level API. Right. So a little bit more about the infrastructure. The, uh, so the relay server, we're solving not punch through with a consistent external IP address and port uh, with improved broadcast. We have the, uh, the Unity multiplayer cloud, which is providing dynamic scalability, not just with the servers, but with the processes as well. And there are the matchmaker, which is providing basic game room creation and configuration. We have the configuration and management interface is integrated with the Unity Cloud dashboard so that you have one place to go for all of your Unity online configuration needs. And here, too, our multiplayer cloud is providing dynamic scalability, not just for the hardware, but for the processes on those hardware. So here's just a, a rough little animation I put together to kind of demonstrate um, how, the, uh, how your game clients might interact with our matchmaker and our relay server. So here's a game client that's come in, and he wants to, uh, he wants to host a new match. So he says to the matchmaker, create, and the matchmaker creates a room on the relay server. That room is returned to the game client. He's disconnected from the matchmaker now, and he joins and connects to the relay server, and he now becomes the game server and is connected to send and receive updates. So now somebody comes in and wants to play, and they ask to join a game like what has been set up. The room has been returned to the game client. They disconnect from the matchmaker, connect to the relay server directly, and now they are connected to other players and are sending and receiving updates. So to, to wrap up, I wanted to uh, evangelize a bit on multiplayer. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the Unity networking team are very, very passionate about multiplayer games, multiplayer technology. Um, you know, we think you know, everyone should be able to make multiplayer games, and we think that uh, you know, if we can make it easy for you all to do so, then we'll see more cool stuff out there. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the many good reasons for adding multiplayer if you are not already doing so. And, uh, you know, of course, you need to understand the pain. And I'm driving to a point at the end of that. So the reasons, of course, we think games are meant to be played together. Uh, multiplayer is kind of a core part of our video game tradition. If you, if you think back to the, um, the old arcade games with uh, multiple player possibilities and how fun it was to play with your friends. And, of course, we think multiplayer is just more fun. The AI can't really compare to an actual human opponent. Uh, from a business perspective, you should note that uh, playtime actually matters. So if you have a single-player game with just uh, uh, maybe a dozen levels that can be consumed in four hours, uh, players may think twice before giving you their, their $20 or their $60, because they think maybe four hours is not long enough. But when you add multiplayer, you add more gameplay. And there's, you know, potentially infinite playtime possible because uh, there's never a repeat in uh, behavior when you're playing against humans. So thus you have added value, and uh, people are more likely to buy your game. Players also play your game longer. And if, you're, if, your game, if you do microtransactions in your game, then you do have more opportunities to, to do that. And uh, finally, we know that multiplayer games are growing more popular year over year. Uh, according to the NPD, 72% uh, of U.S. respondents said they played games online, which was up from 67% last year, and will growing year over year. Right, but the pain, we know that, uh, like, if you're not a networking engineer, it requires fairly deep knowledge of networking protocols. Uh, if multiplayer were easy, probably every game would have multiplayer. Uh, but if you can solve that problem, then you have a new problem of just getting players to find each other. If you can solve that problem, you have a new problem getting players to connect with each other. And uh, solving all those problems actually involves a fair bit of uh, associated infrastructure that you might not have thought of from the beginning, which is not really game development, not really fun. 
And, uh, and then you realize, you know, the cost of, you have to scale that up and down based on demand, which requires a fair bit of experience to get right. So my point is that, of course, Unity removes the pain for you. Um, the high-level APIs eliminate the need for deep knowledge of networking. But of course, if you are a network engineer, the low-level API exposes access to the transport layer to do your own thing. The matchmaker is solving your problem of players finding each other. And our relay server solves your problem of uh, players connecting to each other. And of course, we solved the problem of the associated infrastructure. So now you can easily add multiplayer to your game. Players will have more fun with your game, and more people will buy your game. And of course, people play longer, giving you more chances to microtransact with them. Yeah, so to summarize, the Unity multiplayer technology is easy to use, professional networking technology tools and infrastructure for making your game multiplayer. It removes the pains of multiplayer development. It is tightly integrated with the Unity engine for speed and performance. Uh, and it is, of course, flexible to support full spectrum of game types. And that's it. Do, thank you. And do you have any questions? Any, anyone with a question? No? Well, I'll, also, if you think of a question later, uh, or you don't, uh, don't want to ask right now, please email me directly, erikj at unity3d.com. I would love to get more feedback, uh, like I got last year. And uh, I would love to, to do more work with you all to make this technology for you even better. All right. Well, then, thanks again. <laughs>